BeastNet podcast, sponsored in part by James Safety Services, OCR Buddy, and supported by the fitness community. Here we discuss all things fitness related, running, rucking, mental health and preparedness, and of course, obstacle course racing. Welcome to the BeastNet. We don't bite hard. Hey everybody, it's Mike with BeastNet here, and today I've got with me Ian Hosek. Ian, kind of let everyone know who you are. Hi everyone. Uh... As Mike said, I'm Ian Hosick. I've been in OCR since 2011, so quite some time. Um, competed on the Elite Circuit in Spartan for a long time, as well as many of the other monetary races. Um, and dipped my toes in kind of just for fun mud runs in 2011 in a local race in San Luis Obispo, California. And then got hooked on OCR kind of a little bit after that and then really dived in in 2014. Um, I also do professional endurance coaching. So that's my full-time job along with racing. And I um, coach a number of OCR athletes as well as hybrid athletes out there. So nice. uh, I love it and it's fun and I really enjoy it. Awesome. Yeah, I'm getting more into the the hybrid kind of whatever the the rucking and all that kind of stuff. I've done it a little bit over like 2000 and stuff like that, but I've ran into a group here down in Houston and we've been like, we did a seven mile, seven mile rock over the weekend. So nice. That's a, Just, that's a solid rock. Yeah. We did seven miles out in the middle of the park out here. The, I always forget the name of the stupid park out here in Texas, but I'm new to Texas. I'm still getting used to it out here, but I got lucky. I found a really good group. Um, one of the people I did a met in during a Spartan ultra lives down here and she got me hooked up with a good group of people who go out rocking and it's nice to, to find a group to do it with. Yeah. So, I co I actually coach like three or four hybrid athletes down in Texas. Nice. All over, yeah, group, all over. <laughs> the group I hang out with, they actually do that. I don't know if you've seen them, the rock straps. I don't know what that is. You don't know what the rock rock strap is? It's these straps hey. that they made, and you have to look them up. It's like called the rock strap, and it hooks onto your strap, so when your shoulders get tired, you can just push up. Interesting. And it takes the weight off your shoulders. They're amazing. So the group that I rock with, they they he's the guy who designed them. Oh, and nice. They're, they're it's a game changer when your shoulders start to get just that extra, you know, that just to take that weight off your shoulders for a couple minutes. Yeah, it looks like some nylon blowing with a carabiner. Yep. And then you just kind of give a little tug up front. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah that, that, that makes total sense. Oh yeah. They're awesome. I love them. So, but yeah, so that's the group I've been kind of hanging out with down here and doing stuff. Um, just trying to get back into the, the correct shape. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, a process. <laughs> I'm slowly coming out of winter as well. Well, part of it, most, most of the listeners know, um, a year and a half ago, I bid it on a, an Ironman and mm. messed up my knee and my shoulder. Yep. So it kind of took out and I went from about 180 to about 245 right now. Yeah. That's I'm trying tough. to get back into it. And in fact, I'm doing, I'm doing an Ironman for five days, but six days. So have fun. Yeah. It's a, it's a half it's Galveston. It's flat. Okay. So yeah, that'll it's, be nice. It's, it's a flat course. So it'll be good. The The one that I, I wrecked on was Washington and it was just like massively hilled. Mm -hmm. so but, yeah and you're moving on those tri bikes you're not going slow no no yeah i've got an s works so and that one goes good so that one m will move quite well yeah so. <laughs> yeah so it'll be interesting it's going to be different though just because i'm bigger now than i was but i've been mm -hmm. training i know i can do the distance i can do it and it should be good so yeah i know i need to do some more afterwards i mean it's one of those like i told everyone once i'm finished i'm not done training this is just to get me moving you know Give me that starting goal. goal, starting goal, and then I think I want to just see if I can better it and do Waco and later in the year. So nice, yeah, yeah. that sounds great. That sounds fantastic. It's been one of those. I'm trying to come back out of it. Like I said, I, I was before COVID, I was 310 pounds, and then during COVID, I dropped all the way down to 180, and then I crashed on the Ironman and kind of jumped back up a little bit. So it's kind of that weight fluctuation is what kills you sometimes. Yeah, injuries are hard, especially knee injuries. They're just brutal. Yeah, and my problem is both my knees are already shot. So mm -hmm. I took them both out, one of them in high school and the other one like, what, I was 21. Is when it I ACL, my... MCL or meniscus? Um, or, or My everything. left knee, 
is the pretty much everything <laughs> and my right knee is the mcl Got so it. yeah so well, my left just... knee was one of those i i damaged it and then never quite it would let it heal and then i would do something and ended up actually and like damaging i think it was the meniscus first then i did the acl and then like all within a year it got my mcl oh that's fun so like as each one was wasn't fully healed i ended up tearing the other one and so it was just yeah yeah at the end of it my doctor's like don't move (laughs) just go straight just only go straight so yeah and that's the knee i hit when i went down yikes yikes well i'm sorry to hear that but i'm happy to hear that you're getting back into it especially with rocking that's quite hard on the knees it can be it can be but i mean it's you know it's it helps though it it seems to help and gets me moving because i mean you can do you seem to burn a lot more a lot faster at least it feels like it anyway well, you are moving more mass in general when you add a ruck, so it, you're going to have a higher work output. So, yeah, burning more calories would make sense. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, and I, I've got, I've actually got a couple rucks now. So, and I built the whole gym in my garage. So, nice. it's been, it's been nice. It's been a good move down here. So, so for you, like you said, you do a, a, the training with, you know, OCR athletes and, you know, hybrid running. What got you into the, the training portion? I mean, so I mentioned kind of how, what got you into the racing, what got you into the training? Yeah. So I've always been athletic and interested in science. And then kind of those two passions combined, I went to school for materials engineering and don't even touch on that anymore. Minus kind of the engineering mindset or like scientific method. Mm-hmm. But, um, after school, I ended up working at uh, hammer nutrition for about just under a year learning more about science. And then I worked at Nike for about four and a half years. And during that time, I was working with a lot of like the super duper smart PhD Nike people um, with sports science, their research lab, um, just soaking it all in and learning what I could. Uh, In 2016, I think I picked up a couple clients just doing it recreationally because I was getting big in the OCR scene and then people were interested to train with me. And I really, really enjoyed that. And turns out I was pretty good at it. So I then decided to shift full time to that in 2017. Um, and then just been enjoying that time and coaching and racing since then. That's Not so awesome. much the pandemic, but. Yeah, the pandemic kind of took it out of a lot of us, but I yes. took the, the racing away. But what's funny, though, is technically during the pandemic, I probably raced more than ever because I just started doing all the virtual races everything yeah I then i can just pick like every virtual race and for me i'm i'm a safety guy so i'm i'm the the osha guy that everyone hates but <laughs> <laughs> during the pandemic i all my classes and teaching was online so i would do a class in the morning have like a three or four hour break and then do another class in the afternoon and it's like mm-hmm. oh well there's a park next door and i would just go run virtual races in the park on my breaks well there you go that works it, it did. That's what it took me from 310 to 180. So Yeah, kept a lot of people sane, or the virtual races tried to keep us sane, I guess. They tried, but you missed the you missed the camaraderie. It's not the same. <laughs> yeah. Not. That's what I found I missed the most, was the camaraderie of friends at races. So Oh, yeah. Yeah, the atmosphere is fantastic. It is, it is. So, now I know you do... You, you do the training. Now you've also been working on the USA OCR. So I've mentioned it and it's talked a few times because we've had Megan, Megan on, she comes on about once a month. So, okay, great. And Ma- so people Megan have has... heard, have heard of USA OCR, which is a great yes. start. Cause that's usually yes. meaning I don't have to go into the full 10 minute spiel of what national federations are and why they exist and all of that fun stuff. Yeah. So yeah, Megan has mentioned it a little bit. I mean, she hasn't gone too deep into it, but she's mentioned it, you know, that she's been working with you and other people on, you know, standardizing, doing all that kind of stuff and working with USAOCR. But um, I guess, can you tell everyone kind of a little bit about what it is? Yeah. So USAOCR is just kind of the OCR version of what you would see for USATF or a U.S. try or USA swimming or any of those other national federations, that's what USA OCR is. Um, the, our purpose is to help grow the sport in a safe and fair manner. Um, obviously getting more people involved is great, but we also wanna see the races that are being put on have a safety aspect where 
you're not going to be climbing up a rig and then it falls on top of you. Um, that's not necessarily, we don't see that very much nowadays, but it's something that we strive for in standards um, as well as the insured side of things. And then on the fairness, um, race officials and standardization within the obstacle itself. So yeah. the spear throw is the easy one I always like to use. You come up to a spear throw. One of them has a pile of hay. The other doesn't. One of them spear has a bent tip and weighs 16 pounds versus the other one. It's like a nice light wood and it has a perfectly pristine tip. Um, that never just, happens. That never happens. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, using those standards and making it more fair for everyone competing on the competition side. Um, mm -hmm. That's mostly where we focus, not so much as the open racers, but um, with our development programs, we're like hoping to bring younger kids in as we progress. Um, so our development committee just had our uh, first USA OCR coach development level one cert recently, which went really well in California. And then we also will be developing technical officials. So like the ones who are at higher level races and have been trained and aren't just volunteers out there for a free race day. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And actually the volunteers are super duper important, but they have to be able to report to someone who knows what's going on and can have some level of authority. Which makes sense. Cause I mean, a lot of people, you know, for open racers, which most time, cause I'm racing with more heart than cars, a lot of times and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we're almost always open for open racers. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't, Yeah. but I have been on those competitive you know, when I was down at 180 pounds, I feel my best. I did a couple competitive races. And the one thing I will tell you that drove me nuts the most was to see that person that skirted past the official, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, where all of a sudden, you know, I, I, and I can remember it perfectly. I went down on the rings cause I tore my hand, went down, started doing my burpee, saw someone drop off the rings, looked right at the official and the official as they turned their head and just turned and ran. And it's like, well, who's, who's holding them accountable? <laughs> yeah. And that's, no one wants that. And I mean, no. that, it's, there's the accountability factor, but if that person feels okay with doing that and then just ruining everyone else's race day or competition, um, we want, we want to avoid that and we don't have yeah. people in place to, um, to adjust that. Uh, another big thing that we do in the organization is we also develop the national team and select the national team for international races. And this year, there is the World Obstacle Obstacle Course Racing World Championship in Costa Rica, um, which is pretty cool at that kind of at the tail end of August, August 20th. Um, and one of the big things I wanted to highlight today is that we still have applications open for the national team with USAOCR. Um, mm -hmm. You can go to our website with USAOCR.org and then click on national team and then see the application and criteria. Um, this year, they are not putting any barriers or number limits for age group. So any age group member who has ran OCR in the past and wants to go to Costa Rica on the national team, you're more than welcome to join us. Um, go ahead and apply. Elite, they are putting restrictions on. So there are five uh, men and women per gender per race. Um, and the race distances or distances are the hundred meter, uh, which is a standardized short course, hundred meter, um, then the three K short course, and then the 15 kilometer standard course. Nice. And, and I know that's a big thing that a lot of people have been pushing for is that standard standardization. Cause that was kind of the one thing, you know, you mentioned you got into like the OCR and started doing races in what, 14. Yeah. I can remember doing 15 where, I mean, I still have a, the hoodie that says, you know, Spartan super eight plus, mm -hmm. you know, and I can remember doing, what was it? Montana 2015 and seeing like mile 21 <laughs> on a beast. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, the beasts were a bit different back in the day. They were. And I think that's the one thing a lot of people don't understand. Cause I can remember Montana beasts 2016. I think it was like two of my friends got hurt, but we just kept pushing mm -hmm. and we were out there for like, because they were hurt, but we were just going for almost 11 hours mm -hmm. everyone's like how did it take you 11 hours to 13 miles i'm like it wasn't 13 miles it was over 20 yeah it's different <laughs> it was different before they standardized it because they were just like yeah it's 13 plus and you never knew yeah yeah you you know maybe like a day in advance they're like oh yeah it's here's the map and it's plus or minus two miles and it's like a 15 mile course so yeah but yeah 
Yeah, and we're, I mean, our goal isn't to tell races what specific obstacles to have, how to run their races. Well, kind of on the safety and fairness issue. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is what we're doing and give people our gold stamp of approval. Um, but it's more like if for the competition side, have like the 3K as a standard distance, have the 15K as that's other standard distance and the 100 meter, which is fully standardized and very mapped out. Um, and it's more ninja-esque kind of looking um but it is quite fun to spectate i got to look at it and watch it last year in belgium which was the previous world championships and it's a great it's great for the sport it's really good for tv um great for viewership but we're not telling local races like oh you need to have six rigs and be exactly 15 kilometers um for a non-championship event so ra yeah. races that we would host walls obviously standardize those distances but um we're not here to like put the smack down on creativity no and i mean that's one thing i think a lot of people need to understand i mean if it's there's going to have those ocrs that aren't part of you know the standardization they're just you know an ocr they're a fun run but the idea of the standardization for safety is huge you know someone who like i said my job is safety so and i've seen so many times companies cheap it yeah but <laughs> the only word i can come up with you know and people talk about oh there's no way i mean if though they built these obstacles they have to hold no you've been around long enough and so have i to know that there have been stories you know and reports of ocrs having obstacles fail yeah one of my first races back and this was a long time ago, um, there was a water obstacle that was quite tall and it fell over. Enough people got on it one side that it actually tipped the obstacle because it was wood and floating and it fell over. No one got hurt, but it was quite the... That's that's not something you you would call safe. And no. <laughs> insurance doesn't like those things. No. And I've done, I've done a few, you know, way back. Ones that don't exist anymore surprise surprise um that there was a couple of them where you went to go on the obstacle and you're like yeah i don't think so no, i'm just gonna go around this one <laughs> yeah. and it's not because of fear it's because i don't think this obstacle is gonna hold <laughs> yeah you know? or even i mean water is super dangerous i know mm -hmm. a number of years ago uh a female athlete i knew jumped in the water and just like had a jagged metal piece go directly into a knee speaking of knee issues um so yes, things like that. Uh, those are things we're trying to help out within the sport and lower insurance costs by making it safer. Um, yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand either. They're like, oh, what, what does this help with? It helps lower the insurance costs. And if we lower the insurance costs for the the event, it's going to lower the cost for your sign up. Yeah. I mean, it, and, it's, and if you're an age group and you drop off a rig and the other guy drops off a rig, you'll both have to do a penalty or whatever yep. like penalty is required at that time. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things that it's, it's one of the, me and Megan have talked about this many times, the, the penalty versus mandatory completion. And I think it's the penalty depends on the rig, but some of them, I like the idea of mandatory completion on some of them, but because I've seen so many times where you get that person just fast enough that, you know, they're like, I can't do this anyway. So they like mm -hmm. touch the obstacle and then just go do the penalty because they know they can beat it. Yeah. So the nice thing, I mean, that it has its benefits and not benefits. Mm -hmm. um, one thing or the system that kind of the international level uses and kind of the national levels are adopting is the three band system. So you get three fails and well, actually you get two. And if you lose your third band, you'd get a DNF. So it's essentially mandatory for two obstacles. And then that third one is just no good. And then at the end there, or at the obstacle, there are penalties, um, either a heavy carry or a crawl or whatever, an extra running loop. Um, Burpees are challenging because of standardization of burpees, and there's <laughs> that's yes. the whole issue for many years. Um, but that's that's kind of where the standardization is leaning on that front for the competitive side. Which makes sense. I mean, that's kind of one of those things. I mean, it's kind of a, a mix of the two. And I mean, I think the hardest thing for years is because most people, because of Spartan and some of these other ones, are like, oh, burpees, burpees. But like you said, the standardization of burpees is a lot more difficult than people think. I mean, how many times have you 
like I can remember one time someone's like, oh, watch this person. They beat like the most amount of burpees in like 10 minutes. And you're watching them going, what are they doing? They didn't do one burpee. <laughs> Yeah, it's like they didn't do one real burpee. What what is that? You yeah. know, but that's what they called a burpee. And it's like, that's not even a burpee. So then it was just kind of okay, uh, does the burpee include a jump? Does it include this? And it's like, well, yeah, as far as I knew, I mean Spartan like laid it out. This is what it is, you know. Yeah. But I've seen so many different versions. And even with Spartan laying it out in the pro circuit, like you'd still have race like money being shifted around because people didn't do quote proper form of a burpee, even though they're, mm -hmm. I mean, they were trying to, but maybe their chest didn't touch the ground or maybe they didn't like get fully bent arms or something or uh, a big one that they always liked was your hands have to be above your head. So if they're like here, that doesn't count. Um, so yeah, it was, it's just a, it's not the best, best method in my mm -hmm. opinion. You know, because I could see the hand thing. You you get in a hurry, and I mean, you're still getting the jump, but I mean, you may not get your hands completely flipped up. But yeah, and it just makes me think. I did what was it, San Antonio like two years ago when they turned it into what they called the Ultra Super. They just made us do two <laughs> yeah, laps of the sprint. Two laps. Yep. By the time I finished that, like the last two obstacles, I like do burpees, and I'm like, I'm just gonna lay on the ground and like flop around because my arms don't work anymore. Because mm -hmm. it was very upper body heavy the whole thing. Like I got yeah. the bender and like had to like use my other arm to flip my arm up just to even grab it but oh fun <laughs> oh it was it was brutal because that's a lot of obstacles and yeah they were just the way they set them up there yeah the way they set them up it was really like there was a bunch of them right in the beginning and then you did all the the distance and then came back and all the rest were right at the end mm -hmm. so they were just one right after another with like a hundred feet between them yeah. So it was like, by the time you hit like the last one, I think they finished with rope climb and I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to go do the burpees because my arms are only lift up. Yeah. And rope climb's not one you want to have like tired arms and then you get no. halfway up and then you're like, oh, now I got to fall off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I could see the idea with the burpees and I mean the, 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 the bands. So with the bands, is it an automatic, like if you don't finish it and there's no penalty, you just lose the band. Lose the band. And then there's di the one variation or the, the one race I've done that had that system, which was in Belgium last year, was at the end of the race, you had a penalty loop, which was a heavy carry, or in this case, a keg roll. They had full kegs, and then many people would just roll them around the penalty loop. You could pick it up and run with it, but people were pretty toast at that point. Um, I can see that. Yeah, so they would, uh, if you, you started with three bands, if you failed an obstacle, you got a band cut. If you came to the finish and you had no bands, you had a DNF as your result. Or uh, I think it's actually, it's either did not complete, I don't know the exact terminology, but you did not have a competitive time. I'll say that. So you finished the race, you just didn't get a competitive time. Yes. Yeah. I know I did one where they had, it was similar, but you had a band and then every, it was only one band, but every time you, failed an obstacle they put a dash on your band got it and then when you finished there was that was how many loops like penalties you had to do before you cross finish line and the way they actually did it it was you had to do um i think it was like six jumping burpees mm -hmm. towards the finish line and then if you that was one loop and then if you had another mark you had to go back and do it again and start over and just keep so doing you six and keep until doing you it yep. get close until you got all the, the the marks off yeah that's an interesting um yeah i mean that's the same concept i'm just thinking yeah. about for like race logistics and like not having to use as many bands <laughs> yeah that was it so yeah they just had one band but at the each obstacle the the course marshal or whatever would have a, a, a sharpie mm -hmm. and if you failed they put a you know a little tally on your 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 band and then when you finish the course marshal at the end will say, okay, you've got six, six tallies. That's six loops yeah, before you can finish. 36 jumping burpees. Yeah. Which doesn't sound like a lot until you have two 36 jumping burpees. Oh, so. I, I have done plenty of burpees in my day. I, yeah. I know how tiring burpees can be. And what made it even more interesting, this was a team race. So you counted up between the team. Of oh, three. that's no fun. How many was on each person's? So if you, if you had two, but the rest between your team, there were six, everybody did six. That's a lot. Oh, it's per person. Per oh, person. Interesting. 
It's so then you couldn't it. cross yeah. until you finish until everybody everyone finished. Yeah, finished. that that stacks up pretty quick. Hopefully, not too many failures. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a fun event. It was crazy. It was one. It was out in the middle of Oregon, but in That's... Bend, Oregon, it was a blast. Oh, fun! Yeah, Bend's a fun place. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So, and that's the one thing that I think I like about the idea with the USAOCR is trying to standardize because you do get that like, oh, at this race, they do this. At this race, they do this, which is great to see the innovation and see the different things. But if they're going to turn this into a, you know, I know that the big word that everyone always uses is that Olympic event. If that happens, I know that's going to happen. That's down the way. But if they're going to turn it into a standardized race worldwide, there has to be standardization. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if I'm, you know, say whatever, I do the best in the USA, but my standards are completely different what they're doing in the UK. You know, yeah. how do you compare that? Yeah. And that is the nice thing is they are developing a lot more standardization at the international level, which is allowing the national federations to be more standardized throughout countries as well. Um, obviously, we have different individual national federations doing things differently but um we still can say oh this is kind of how we have coach development this is how we're training our technical officials um we're all following the 100 meter three kilometer and 15 kilometer distances um i think the biggest difference is what you'll see is the different obstacle variety between national federations and just countries whereas mm -hmm. like europe <clears throat> has a they usually have much harder rigs than we do they have a lot more rig companies their holds are smaller they're more dynamic um the u.s has some challenging stuff but it's not quite you won't see as many rigs as you would see in like europe on yeah. like a tough toughest or something like that um i would say savage race is about the closest but they still some of their rigs are not as challenging i would say hmm. I got to get out to a savage race. Now that I live in Texas, there's more races. They so. do. Yeah. I'm one of the several savage races I've done has been in Texas. It's fun. Yeah. I'm from, I'm originally from Seattle. And then that was one nice thing when I moved down here, I'm looking at all the races going, Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Seattle does have a good number, but it's not, I would say Texas definitely has a lot more. Seattle's losing them though. They're down to pretty much, if you really look at it besides some of the local ones, the only big names that go up there is Spartan and Tough Martyr, and you get them two weekends. Yeah, and that's not that's not very much. <laughs> it used to be more, but it's just yeah. Over the years, as as brands have dropped off, it's you know Savage and those haven't made it really to the West Coast yet. Yeah, I think they're trying, but they're going slowly, and it's not like OCR is in its major boom like we were having no. in the late late two thousand teens. No, and, and I think you know COVID kind of helped that you know, kill that off a little bit. But the other thing too, is it's logistics. You know, that's why usually if you see Spartan go over to the West coast, they get like four or five rows, you know, races one right after the other in mm -hmm. different areas in the West coast. Cause now they have the rigs over there. Yeah. So that Spartan actually has two different ones. So yeah. that's why they're able to do that. But that like, when you look at other companies that aren't quite as big, um, yeah, yeah that, that is the challenge. Yeah. It's like they, 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 to get everything over there, you know, and I know a couple of them tried, but if they don't get the, the pre signups, you know, it's like, cause why, they're gonna, they going to make drive? Yep. Yeah. Why drive across the U S. Um, yeah. and I, th I think numbers are increasing though. I did see something think... today, uh, that posted like quarter numbers or first quarter numbers for the past four years have been steadily on the rise, which is great. Um, that is, but it's, it's slowly coming back. And I think it, we did have a pullback in OCR in general, and it's now kind of finding that foundation where it can survive and then it's going to grow again. I'm hoping so, because I, I mean, it's one of those things that I think, like I said, I think COVID kind of took it away because a lot of people, you know, we didn't want to go outside. They don't want to go do those things. And we weren't allowed to do those events. Um, and now all of a sudden people still have a little bit of that fear. Yeah. And I'm hoping that that's kind of going away. You're starting to see more and more people out at events. You know, I've done a couple already this year and I'm starting to see more people again, which is good. Yeah. Hopefully they just remember outside is still safe. Hopefully. Do you like the BeastNet? Do you want to keep hearing it? Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more at BeastNetPod.
Oh, I didn't say that it was. Did I say it was the end? It closes the end of April for no, the national team. Okay. I now can they know. Couple. Now they know. Yeah. Uh, the national team registrations and applications close end of April. So you got one more month um, for age group. Everyone who applies, you can go if you've done some OCR races and then the elite team qualifications for points. Um, and you can see that point breakdown on the website as well. Yeah. And we'll make sure to put a link on the the, the show notes so people can find that easily. That'd to, be fantastic. To find that stuff. Well, what other things does USA OCR need besides just you know, the, the, the athletes to be able to, you know, go nationals, anything else that listeners can do to help USA OCR, like get out there more and people get to know what it is. Yeah. I mean, um, we are accepting donations, obviously money's everyone always wants money. Um, we are a nonprofit national governing body. So we, and we're still very new. So we're looking at making money through various means. We had our coaching level one sir recently, we are going to have an auction coming up soon, which will be exciting. Um, a lot of good value out of that. And then uh, eventually we will have registration um, fees for like USA OCR members. And that'll be similar to like USA Try or all the other ones I mentioned where you can do an annual membership or like a day membership if you just need it for a specific race. Um, we're always looking for volunteers. Uh, if you want to get involved, please reach out. Um, all of our contact information is on our website uh, or you can just reach out to me directly on Instagram or any any of the social media methods um and then we also you can see the board of usa ocr so maybe there's someone you know on there and you can reach out to them directly uh, we do have a number of committees so um we can usually find a niche for anyone who wants to get involved very nice very nice it's one of those things too and i think a lot of people i don't know because ocr has never had that like governing body where you you know which a lot of people don't realize like if you do triathlons that was one of the things i got surprised by when i first started doing triathlons they're like okay well you have to be a member of the usa triathlon i'm like the what <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know and it was like you could pay i think it was like 15 bucks for a day to do the to do a race mm -hmm. or it was i don't remember what it was i just get the annual every year because i do enough triathlons and i'm like yeah it's just i'll end up paying that much by the end of the year anyway so mm -hmm. So that's is that technically kind of what the OCR is going to be like, but the USO OCR races will have that. Yeah, eventually. Once we eventually, get this, yeah, yeah, we're, and we're we're still a very new organization. I think this mm -hmm. is like our second or second two and a half years of really um, with our feet under us. There's been a couple of different iterations in the past that weren't as or they didn't survive. Um, and the community wasn't as accepting or kind of didn't understand what was going on. Um, but we're here now, we're looking to grow slowly and really have a good foundation and listen to what the athletes and community want. Um, we're happy if the, like if it goes to the Olympics using that magic word again, but that's not like our sole driving purpose. Um, our purpose from USA OCR for the US is to have a fair and safe, fair and safe races for the athletes. Which is, I mean, which is huge. Like I said, that's one of the big things like for me and safety, um, safety is huge. And a lot of people don't realize too, how much, like I said earlier, safety saves you money. Yeah. <laughs> the the safer the sport is and the safer you can show. And like, you know, a lot of times too, especially if USA OCR gets big enough, like it becomes kind of a, a thing for insurance companies like, Oh, you're a member of USA OCR. So you must be doing it right here. We're going to lower your rates. Yeah. You know, and, and I've seen that with, you know, some other stuff. And that's one reason why I like USA triathlon. That's one yeah. of the things, a lot of companies, if you're part of USA triathlon, usually you have to reach certain standards, which insurance companies look at and go, okay, we're going to cheapen your rates. Yeah. And this is all part of our long-term plan. Yeah. Um, that's what we want to accomplish because we know the model works. Risk is expensive. Safety, mm -hmm. even though it may be on an obstacle course and you're swinging through monkey bars or rings or who over who knows what, does have some inherent risk, but it, that's your liability, not necessarily the race mm -hmm. companies if everything's yeah. built to spec. Yeah, and everything's built to spec. And that's the big key, everything built to spec. And I mean, you want to make sure that as the company is taking everything, doing everything they can to make the obstacle as safe as possible, there's always some risk. I mean, you could fall mm -hmm. off the obstacle, land wrong, do whatever, but hopefully you're not going to find a big chunk of metal in the water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> things can, things that can be avoided and taken yeah. care of ahead of time. Which is one of those things because I had a, some similar, but it was rocks. 
but it was one of those ones yeah. I thought that the water looked deeper than it was. So when I yeah. came off the rings and I hit the water, I didn't straighten my legs out because I figured I was going to hit water and it was fine, but the water was like six inches deep. Yeah, and that would be where you put a sign that says shallow water or yeah. something like that. Um, yeah, so like, that's, oh. arguably, that's arguably more dangerous than having flat ground because that six inches allows you to drown in it as well as you land differently when you think you're going to go into deep water versus like hard packed. Yeah. Yep. So true. Which you know from personal experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You hit the water. Like I said, you're expecting it deep. You're like, oh, whatever. But then all of a sudden, you know, because that was the reason I didn't straighten my legs. I'm like, oh, I'm going to hit the water. If I straighten my, you know, whatever, I don't want to hit wrong. So I'll just land, you know, with my knees bent and nope, six into the water. Yep. Right on my knees. I'm like, oh. That, that's unfortunate. I finished, but I was limping pretty good. Yeah. So, yeah. Which, all right. Well, it's been great talking to Ian. I mean, if there's nothing else you got to, to say to the listeners, I mean. Yeah, we can sign off. That was great. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful. This was awesome. And thank you. And if you ever want to come on, if there's anything else you want to talk about, reach out to us. We, we will help okay. USA Triathlon any way we can. Or Triathlon. <laughs> USA OCR. Yeah. Any way we can. So um, That's great yeah. to hear. Yeah, really appreciate it. So, all right. Well, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Have a great night and uh, we'll chat soon. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the BeastNet podcast. If you haven't done it yet, find us on Facebook. Like and share the podcast. Give us a review on iTunes or Spotify. All these things will help to expand the show in the future. Don't forget to subscribe and let us know what you think and what you'd like to hear. Yeah.